All right, well, good to see you all, and looking forward to picking back up on Teach Us Your Word. Um, it's been a few weeks since we've looked at this, and today we'll be talking um, about something that hopefully we find encouraging to think about, obligations or application. Um, just by way of reacquainting us and getting our minds going, um, just a reminder, this uh, what we've been teaching, especially with the CAPTOR method, is based on Daniel Doriani's book, um, Getting the Message. And the subtitle is A Plan for Interpreting and Applying the Bible. And so we've been reading through this, and then there's also a class he's taught on this. And um, it's a really helpful book. If you just want one in your library, there, there are other good books, but this, this one has some really helpful things. And um, we just definitely want to give him credit for the way this has been uh, put together. Um, this is a class of acronyms. And so, yeah, after a two-week break, now's the real test, right? I should have passed out quizzes. How fun would that have been? Anyone think that would be fun? No, nobody thinks that's fun. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, the quizzes are just a game. Um, it's, it's fun. Class of acronyms. TPCA overall meditative method, right? What does the passage teach? Um, what can I praise God for about the passage? What does it call me to confess? What can I ask God for? So helpful to just have on our minds. Um, maybe in the morning you're just kind of blanking. How do I even go to the Word? Um, think of toilet paper, California, and you can just go from there. T-P-C-A. Um, then the captor method is really a way of thinking about what does the passage teach. And so that's what we've been spending a lot of our time walking through, is this captor plan, captor um, method. And so here's the quiz. I, I'll give you the C. So C is context. What's the context? Anyone remember what the A is in captor as we're considering a text? Piper. Uh, what'd you say? I, I can't even hear you. It's such a silly answer. What is it? Aaron's? Look, analyze. Oh, good. Analysis. I thought you said, what errands do we have to run uh, based on the passage? Um, Costco is the answer to that. Every time. Every time. Uh, context analysis. Good. All right. Um, and then C-A-P. Anyone for the P? What problems are in the text? Like what things don't we understand that we need to look into? Then we looked at the T, uh, which is considering themes. It's kind of um, what themes are present in the text or coming to the Bible looking for an answer to a theme or a question. And then today, dun, 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 obligations, which really is just, I'm going to tell you up front, it's just applications, but I think he had to make it fit into captor, and that would be captar, and that wouldn't work. So um, obligations is what we're going to do, and then reflections is what Ryan will pick up in uh, two weeks as we wrap this up. So today we're looking at obligations, and that's the, the captor method there. So um, when we think about obligations, it's really just another way of saying, how do we apply the text to ourselves? What obligations does it bring to us? Um, it's actually assuming a lot to think that we'd even need to ask that question. Maybe as, you, as I'm saying that, you're like, oh, of course we have to think of what does the text um, obligate us to. But um, it's amazing how much we could just read the Bible as a book of facts or a data thing or a storybook and miss the point that it's actually supposed to be shaping us in ways. And so today's looking at how it shapes. So if we ask the question, how do we arrive at obligations? That's kind of the overarching thing we'll be considering today. And it's important to realize this point here. I should have done a black slide. Ryan's, ah, uh, anyhow. Close your eyes. Just, just kidding. Uh, all of Scripture intends to have an effect on Christians. This sentence is going to come up in a minute, but I just want you to think of that in your head. All of Scripture is intended to have an effect upon us. Um, even genealogies, which is interesting, right? Where do we get that? 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 to 17. Paul's instructions to Timothy, 
But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred, sacred writings. So there it's uh, the Old Testament he's speaking of, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Scriptures making us wise for salvation. Salvation not just in terms, though, of being justified. Cool, sin's forgiven. The scriptures help me understand that. Um, salvation is an all-encompassing being conformed into the image of Christ endeavor by God. And Paul goes on to really explain that. All scripture, he says, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God or the person of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. See those things in yellow? All scripture, complete, um, equipped for every good work. So that's this point. This is really the summary of everything we need to know. <laughs> All of scripture intends to have an effect on Christians. We could also personalize it. All of scripture is intended to have an effect upon me personally as God uses it by the Spirit. Um, and so that then... Um, makes us ask how. But before we do that, so that's how scripture works, um, but that's how language kind of works just in general. The, um, all of scripture intends to have an effect on Christians. Almost everything that we say as people actually is intended to have an effect on another person. Think of the statement, here are the potatoes. Okay? Think of the different contexts. Here are the potatoes could be said, right? Um, it could mean, here are the potatoes. Can you wash them now, right? <laughs> Bake them. Um, here are the potatoes. Take them and pass them <laughs> to the person next to you. It's, it's rarely that we say, here are the potatoes, and we're merely seeking to point out the location of potatoes. It's usually intended for some sort of action. So that's happening with our speech all the time. It's happening on an amazing level with divine speech by the power of the Spirit. So God intends his word to inform us, to win our hearts, and to quicken our hands to the things that he's made us to do. But how does that happen? How does that happen? Um, some say that it just happens as we read the Bible and as we just depend upon the Spirit. Applications just kind of are zapped into our hearts, maybe. Um, some people are wary of applicational method because it may impede what God is seeking to do. It could take away delight. It could deaden the Spirit's work. Um, that create, And so it's a really mystical version of application. It could even be a mystical uh, approach to the text. Just opening the Bible, a verse comes, and then what does that mean to me? And there we go, off and running. Um, as we've seen throughout this class, we should have a more methodological approach to understanding scripture in its context and what it means. So also with our application. It's a false dichotomy to say that methods of application um, override the Spirit's work or deaden the Spirit's work. It's a both and. God has given us methods by which the Spirit uses to help us better understand how the text applies to ourselves. And so today we're going to get an overview of that. Um, as with biblical interpretation, applying the scriptures and finding the obligations of scriptures is a lifelong process that is both a science, there are methods to it, there are concrete ways we can grow, um, and it's also an art um, because, as you'll see, it's not all just as simplistic as we might think. And so, um, spoiler alert in the class, part of what I think today's teaching will do is help us see how much we're desperately dependent upon God to help us understand the entirety of his word in order to understand how to apply any of it to ourselves. Very rarely is an application just a simplistic, simple thing. Um, that said, we're doing it all the time. You're hearing it happen every Sunday and, and we can continue to grow in it. It just helps push back against thinking, oh, that's just an easy thing I don't need to think about. 
So four application principles that we'll move through rather quickly, just kind of the lay of the land. When you come to a passage and you're wondering what's it saying um, to you, application depends on accurate interpretation. Our interpretation or our exegesis of the text, what it's actually saying, is the foundation for then saying, how does it apply to us in our present context? Probably a no-brainer in some ways, but if we just jump ahead, that's what's part of the problem of just like reading something and being like, what does that mean to me when we haven't even thought about what it meant in its original context? We're going to go way off in our applications. So all those things about interpretation are helpful. Be sure your application rests squarely on the passage. There are all kinds of good biblical things we could say, um, but is that what the passage is actually saying? And then related to that is the primary application um, should express the main thrust of the text, not a minor side point. So there are all kinds of side issues with texts, especially as we unpack what they're saying. And sometimes we can take even the side issue and then make it the big application. And that's, that tends to get sketchy as well. And then finally, every application should cohere with Scripture as a whole. I really think at the end of the day, if we take this to heart, it's, it's one of the best guardrails for us as we seek to say, what does this passage mean? is how does it square with other things scripture says? And I think we would all come to realize in our own understanding of issues, um, when we haven't considered all of scripture, we can come up with really strange ideas of what the Christian life looks like, right? Um, we'll talk about some of those as we go, but this is the overall principle. So you'll notice this diagram there on your handout. And I just, I want us to, think about this because it's amazing to see how much God uses people in this whole process and how much the Christian life isn't just that a divine word drops out of the sky and immediately summons us apart from the means of interacting with the text as people. So when, in, when we consider any application that's happening, and when I say that, let's think about the... Um, context in which application comes to us. You hear application every Sunday. We're about to hear it in a little bit from Ryan with preaching, right? Um, here we believe that preaching should have application in it. There are some philosophies of preaching that say that that's not how that should happen. Um, that's not here. So hearing preaching, there are applications that are coming to you. Hearing biblical teaching, often in discipleship hour, that's something that's happening, um, or other teachings that you may listen to, um, Jen Wilkins' study in Hebrews, um, applications are happening in a teaching context, and then also on a personal individual level as we look at the text. So when we're talking about application, have those things in mind. This is happening in teaching, preaching, and personal Bible study. In all of it, there are three components. There is the text, there's the interpreter, which is the preacher teacher or you as you're studying the Bible for yourself. And then there's also the audience. And so that would be you all in a context like this. As you're reading the Bible yourself personally, you're both the interpreter and the audience. <laughs> and so that's interesting. Um, in the whole process, as we break down these arrows, see how they're numbered? Um, the goal of application is to take the message of the text to the audience or to the hearer, right? That's um, the goal of what's trying to happen. Um, but it's also the interpreter takes the questions and the needs of the audience to the text. That's part of the process, right? As we're thinking about our life, and the questions that we have, and what it means to exist as a human who's seeking to be a Christian in this life, we bring that to the text, to the text, and ask the text, what is it saying about that? Um, the interpreter, the teacher, also um, needs to discover the Bible's meaning through interpretive skill. So that's why those earlier things in the class are so helpful. As we grow in interpretive skills, we're better able to understand what the text is saying, which is going to affect how the text applies to us. But what's 
so cool about the whole process is that the text also, because of Scripture's authority, has to come to bear on the interpreter itself. And this is where you can see problems happening in what we would call liberal theology, where what the text is demanding of itself um, doesn't have enough bearing on the interpreter, and instead the interpreter's guide to things is what overrides the text. <laughs> and so that becomes problematic. So we're always putting ourselves as the interpreter under Scripture's authority, but then also using our skills to understand the text. So that's part of the dynamic that's happening. Um, teaching well and preaching well involves the interpreter, the teacher, listening to the situation of the audience, um, which means coming to understand the cultural factors that are in play, the presuppositions we may have, the things we are all struggling with. Um, all of that, the better you can listen and understand what people are dealing with, the better you'll be able to talk about Scripture's obligations to us, its applications. But uh, the audience, whoops, wrong way, left-handed. Okay, um, the audience, it's interesting too, the speaker's credibility um, as they do this over time, speaking and teaching and preaching, the credibility also affects our ability to listen to and be changed by application. If someone is saying the most biblically accurate thing that's getting right to the heart of what you need to hear, but you don't know and trust that person, it has bearing on how readily uh, you will apply that teaching, even if it's from God's word. Um, that's just the reality of being human. And so it's a dynamic in that process um, that affects us. Amazing that uh, in a few minutes, like, all this is going to be happening and we'll just be sitting there being like, yeah, Ryan's just killing it. Like, this is great. God's speaking to us. Um, you can break it down into like so many more things that are happening. So there's a lot going on with application and you can see how um, intense it is to grow in effectiveness of it. I want to talk about seven types of applications. And I think this is um, kind of the most interesting thing about what we'll talk about today. Uh, because we... If we're shaped by 2 Timothy 3, what it means is we can expect to find applications in every passage of Scripture. Some passages seem like they have no bearing upon us, right? Like genealogies, um, denunciations of wicked nations back in the Old Testament. We're reading it and we're like, what in the world? I didn't do that to your town. Like, what is this talking about? Um, false teachers. You read about that stuff in the New Testament and what's going on there, and you're just like, whoa, that, I don't have people standing up in church yelling those things. Like, what, what do we do with, with this? Um, a lot of the skill of application comes just in realizing what are we looking for Scripture to be doing? How is Scripture informing us and telling us how to respond? The Bible is not a set of instructions Instead, the entire Bible is instructive. Do you see the difference there? Not an instruction manual, but the whole thing is instructing us, and it does it in multifaceted ways. And so that's, I loved as this was unpacked uh, reading it. I was like, ah, that's what's going on. So hopefully that's helpful to you too. So when we read scripture, we will find laws. Laws require obedience to specific commands, right? Um, they require obedience, yet their very specificity, uh, how specific they are, also prompts questions. When, when laws pops up here, the thing that comes into my head is, ah, easy, like straightforward. But you know what's interesting? They actually can be very tricky to apply. Like, for example, greet one another with a holy kiss straightforward law in scripture, right? Did any of us do that this morning? Like with one another, maybe husband, wife, Mark, good, Anna, but uh, to, to others, like, <laughs> greet one another with a holy kiss, right? Oh, so straightforward. Actually, we're all like, what in the world is going on there? Um, contextually, culturally, there's a lot going on there. Oops. Uh, 
Another example, if your brother sins, go show him his fault. On the one hand, straightforward, okay. On the other hand, all kinds of questions about that, right? And as far as how the rest of wisdom of Scripture applies to that, and power differentials, and victimization, and all kinds of things that we need to think about when we say, how do we obey a very straightforward law, okay? So, we see these commands, greet one another with a holy kiss. Um, these are specific commands, but we usually have to go further to figure out how those commands apply to us. The other category that we see are ideals. Ideals guide a wide range of behavior without specifying particular deeds. So they neither um, command nor forbid a particular action, but they supply the basis for many actions, ideals. So example, love your enemies, right? Um, that, doesn't say, that doesn't say like, get your neighbor's newspaper even if they, their dog pooped on your lawn or something like that. Like that's a very specific thing. It's this overarching idea, love your enemies, and we have to figure out how. Um, be perfect as your, heaven, as your father in heaven is perfect. Seek first the kingdom. These are ideals that are, are forming us. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. See these ideals that are held out, are held out that aren't a specific command to do or not do something. The application of ideals can be a challenge. They also provoke these how questions. Um, how do we honor parents, right? Honor your father and mother. How do we honor parents who are losing strength in body and mind? How do we honor parents who are giving foolish counsel, um, even though these are ideals, right? How do we make peace with cantankerous people? How do we use a gentle answer to turn away wrath when someone's screaming in your face? Um, how does that apply? So they give ideals to strive for, but we need wisdom from the Spirit and from the rest of Scripture to know how to carry out those ideals. So those are laws and ideals, which are kind of similar, just differing in specificity. Um, third, doctrines. We're going through the book of Romans right now, and we haven't gotten to Romans 12, where we start to get to all kinds of commands and ideals. Um, and so what we've been primarily seeing are doctrines. Doctrines state the fundamentals of a Christian belief system. So I say these are things that are true about people or God or the world. Um, the form for doctrinal statements is this. If doctrine X is true, then what follows? This is the question that we seek to applicationally bring to all these doctrines that we find unpacked in Scripture. Um, so we could tease this out a little, right? If all of mankind is created in the image of God, so that's a doctrine, right, that we see unpacked, then what do we owe all people? That's a way of starting to apply the doctrine of the image of God. If God loved me enough to die for me, how should I feel about my failures? See how that's applying atonement, um, love of God. If we are stewards of creation, how should we think about creation and how should we act toward the created world? Starting to apply things from doctrine. If there is but one gospel, what should we do when we meet false doctrine? If all mankind has a sinful nature, what should we expect from unbelievers? See how that's just taking the doctrines that are being unpacked and then saying, then what follows about how I interact and respond to uh, people and things around me? So that's a great formula for thinking through doctrinal truth, especially as we're reading through things like epistles, right? Okay, but a lot of the Bible is filled with narrative. Um, God's actions in narrative show his character and his ways. Ready for a question? Who is the central actor in every Bible story? Jesus, that's a good job. 
How about God? We'll dial it back just a little bit. If we come to the New Testament, we're doing great. But uh, yes. Yeah, we know this, right? But when we come to narratives, it's easy to apply them without remembering that. And this is a really helpful thing to keep in mind. The central character in every Bible story is God. Every passage is showing some aspect of his redemptive purpose, the way he's at work making things right. And we, we can rightly draw moral lessons from biblical history. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the theological lessons are what have to come first, especially as we read narratives. So thinking back, Ryan talked about um, 1 Samuel 17, David and Goliath, right? The chief point of 1 Samuel 17 is not that brave David slaughtered a big giant and by similar courage, we can slaughter our own giants. That's not the main point of 1 Samuel 17. Instead, the main point is the battle is the Lord's and because the battle is the Lord's, he will deliver um, all of you into our hands, that he will take care of his enemies. Um, the enemies of his people. And so, like, that's the truth of that passage that's being shown in David's life and then unfolds throughout the rest of Scripture and applies to our lives. Because David understood that the battle was the Lord's, he fought against Goliath. The moral lesson of David's courage depends on the theological principle of what, who God is and what God does. And so, um, that's kind of how that works. So Old Testament narratives often are focusing on God's covenants. They're focusing on his grace in establishing these covenants with sinful people. Uh, they're focusing on God's faithfulness in keeping his covenant and upholding them, his justice and even his mercy towards those who break his covenant. Those are all theological themes that are happening throughout the prophets and through much of the Old Testament. When we come to the New Testament, and we find gospel narratives, they're pointing mostly to Jesus' forthcoming death and resurrection, what he came to do. Um, but they're also showing things about Jesus that show us God's heart, his compassion, his righteousness, his wisdom. Um, okay, so when we come to narratives in the Old Testament or, well, anywhere in Scripture, they also do talk about human responses, you see the Pharisees, you see the other nations, um, you see David, and you see Abigail. Um, and those show us things about people's faithfulness or their rebellion. But here's the point when we come to narratives. When men and women seize the stage of the story, which is kind of a fun thing to think about, but when they come onto the scene, we should see um, their acts in response to God first and foremost, and then their example of good and bad secondarily. But a lot of times we flip that. We're not looking so much of how are they responding to God. We're looking for things about like um, their virtues in the moment. And um, usually it's more how are they responding to the chief actor of the story. So when we're looking for obligations, God's actions and narratives are a big deal. But then that takes us to the human action part. Narratives and, and the scriptures do give us examples to be imitated or avoided. Um, but just like when I said laws up there and we probably thought, oh, that's straightforward. Um, this is actually often tricky to figure out because the Bible often isn't telling us if what the person did was good or bad. And we're having to figure that out. Um, and so sometimes scripture tells us things to be imitated explicitly. We see commands about that of imitating what Christ did um, in how he put others first and suffered patiently. And so Philippians and um, First Peter are telling us things like that. When Israel bows to the golden calf, it's explicitly called out as wrong to do, right? But what about when, Jeff, oh, when Gideon's like hiding um, from the Midianites when he's threshing grain? What about when Gideon's putting out a fleece? What about when Jephthah's making a vow? Um, disclaimer, never preach on that uh, passage when you're uh, 
a small ship. That's what, uh, I did that, and uh, it was a long story. Anyhow, um, <laughs> so the, the Bible's filled with actions of characters that we can read and we're like, huh, that seemed to go well or didn't seem to go well, but the Bible's not fully telling us what about that action was right and what was wrong. And so we need to tread lightly on those things. We can see the example of David's courage in fighting Goliath, but the scripture doesn't explicitly call us into, well, go draw five smooth stones to slay your own giants or something like that, but have courage and trust in God's promises as we fight against our enemies. But what does that look like? The story of David doesn't tell us a ton about that. So human actions. Um, the Bible is full of all kinds of symbols and images, and it's really beautiful to come to understand how much God is using those to shape us and change us. Um, biblical symbols and images create new ways of seeing things God's way. I think when we think about the Christian life and when we think about the Bible, it can be easy to think of it as an instruction manual or a list of rules. And I just told you that the rules are actually kind of complicated. So that's like, oh no, it's all more work than I thought it was. Um, this I find to be one of the most encouraging things in scripture is that the Bible is not only giving us rules and parameters of what to do and not do, but what it's doing all throughout is helping us to become people who see things differently. And as we see things differently, we respond differently. Um, the Bible creates pictures in our minds many times that aren't doctrinal or a command. For example, in the book of Proverbs, we have Proverbs 26, 13 to 16. See what this does as I read it in your mind. The sluggard says, there is a lion in the road. There's a lion in the streets. And so there isn't a lion, but he's like freaking out that lions are roaming the streets. Not just coyotes like here in Escondido. Um, as a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed rolling over and over again, right? The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Are there any commands in that? Do you need a command that says, don't be a sluggard? <laughs> no, it's like, well, who wants to not have enough strength to like pull their hand to their face, right? Um, it gives us images of ways of seeing the world that help us think about what work, um, what being productive, what rest in contrast to laziness might look like without actually expounding on any of those things, um, which I just find fascinating. There are other images we could think of um, one of the images, the cross of Christ, right? So that comes into play in narrative. It comes into play doctrinally. It comes into play ethically. But when we think of the cross, what is it doing in us? It does a bunch of things, right? It it shapes our thinking as we think about that one item. It shapes our thinking into this amazing confluence of the love and wrath of God mixed together that we could be welcomed, like handled in such a way. So it's an emblem to us of God's love. It's an image to us of the sinfulness of man that the Son of God would be condemned to it. The cross, as we see it, is a call to die to ourselves. Um, it's a call to a way of life. When we think about the cross, it's a call to many deaths and resurrections as we follow the image of our Savior. It's a mark for us of what our lives as Christians should look like. Like it's, it's supposed to be shaping how we see waking up to going to sleep as following Christ in the way of the cross. And there are, there are commands throughout Scripture that tell us things like that. 
but it also becomes to be a, comes to be a way of seeing things that's marked by scriptural imagery, right? Um, another example of this too that I've been thinking more and more about as we've preached through Romans is creation. Um, scripture shapes how we see the created world and what that tells us about God. In Psalm 19, it's telling us that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, right? And the firmament displays his handiwork. Um, and so it shapes us into looking around and saying, wait a minute, what is creation proclaiming about God? That's, a, that's an interesting way of coming to see the world. And then in Romans 8, as Ryan was unpacking it, it's saying creation is waiting in eager longing for the sons of God to be revealed. revealed. Creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth, waiting together, waiting for this glory that we too will share in. That's not telling us, look at creation and consider um, how bad the fall is and how great glory is to come. It's not saying look to creation and see the wonder and intricacy of the God who both made you and the image bearers all around you, but it can shape us into seeing those things as we interact with the world. Um, so uh, that really opens up the Psalms and other especially poetic parts of scripture for us of saying maybe there isn't a command here, but maybe it's trying to alter how I see the world and how I see God. And then finally, um, we looked at that, but songs and prayers, so much of the Psalms, again, show us how to worship and pray. They give us words for the things that we pray, the things that we sing, um, that we can model in our songs and our prayers. Okay. Um, I've talked a lot, but I don't have an overarching question to ask you. So I just keep talking? Patty says, just keep talking. Um, I do think it's just helpful to get these things out there and you can like marinate on them as we go. How's that sound? So those are, those are seven ways to be looking in scripture for ways, that, um, ways it's applying things to us, places application come other than explicit commands. These application questions if we just keep these in mind, they'll help us as we come to any text. If we ask it these things, it'll be interesting to see what comes out. Um, these are four major heart categories that are at the center of human experience. Um, I don't know if I'm just a law-driven person or something, but again, when I think about the Christian life, the first thing that comes to my mind is, what am I supposed to do and not do? But there are all kinds of other questions that shape us that actually, at the end of the day, <laughs> almost weigh more on us than those do or not do things. And this helps us think about those. The first is duty. What should I do? It's what I just talked about. Duties are moral obligations. They tell people what we owe to God, what we owe to others. They give us the rules of right and wrong, these kind of guardrails we seek to stay within. Again, do not steal, do not murder. These are duties that we are called to as those who are created in God's image and especially as those who are saved in Christ. But beyond that, there's also the question not only of what should I do, but who am I and who should I be? And these are the questions of character or virtue, really. What character traits are pleasing to God and to man? What virtues and dispositions is scripture seeking to cultivate within us that then make it easier to do the right thing and avoid the wrong thing? Um, it's, it's kind of the idea, the thief isn't only forbidden from stealing, but also a virtue is to become one who works diligently in order to be able to share uh, with others. And so there's the, these character things. Character grants the capacity to act obediently. Duty says, do the right thing. Character says, righteous people do right things. And the more we're growing in righteousness, 
the more right things will be flowing out of us um, as by God's grace he's instilling these things in us. So we're not always just looking for the rule. We can also be saying what kind of virtue is being held out uh, as who God made us to be and is seeking to make us in Christ. But then there are also goals. Where should we go? Um, What are the causes we should be pursuing that are directing our choices? We often wonder questions of purpose, questions of priority, and the Bible helps us understand how those things work out. Um, Goals operate with the parameters given by the law. So duty asks, um, what should I do, right? Character asks, who am I? And goals ask, where should we go and why? (laughs) What should we be aiming for? And then it also helps us say, and what steps would we have to take to get there? So what this is, is like considering who I am as God made me and the situation I'm in at this particular stage in my life, what goods am I to orient my life around and how am I to prioritize those goods? Um, What does it look like to do excellence in work and faithfulness in parenting and um, giving of myself and receiving in the church? What are the goals that shape that? Not just the don't give up meeting together and use your gifts to serve one another. Uh, So it's bigger than that. And then uh, discernment, how can I see? How can I see? It's not just knowing the rules, but it's also saying, how can I see things as God sees them so that I can choose the right and avoid the wrong as I uh, live out this life? All right, you're ready for something mentally, a little bit of mental stuff, and then we'll practice this, okay? But I just want to talk about this because I find it fascinating. Discernment could be said to be the cousin of wisdom. Now, as soon as we talk about family relationships, I get really confused. Like, is that the cousin once removed or like, how does that work out? Is it by marriage? Anyhow, we don't need any of that. All we need to know is you have wisdom, which is a good thing, right? And its cousin is discernment. If wisdom is skill in the art of living, which is what we would say wisdom is, right? How do I live wisely in the world? Then discernment is skill in the art of seeing. I find that fascinating. Uh, It's making so many things make sense. Wisdom could be said to be knowledge and understanding of God's world and how we live well in God's world. Discernment could be said to be insight into fallen world as it is and understanding what it would look like to engage as God would want it to be. We have to see what's going on as it is in order to be able to respond rightly to it. And so part of what scripture is doing is helping us to see things the way God sees them. Um, So I think that's interesting. So all of these things are core questions in the human heart that God addresses with his word. All right. Let's practice. Uh, And we can practice by ways of steps. The first step with application is determining the original meaning. So, Caleb, do you have the microphone? We're going to do this. Let me uh, read this passage, and then we're going to interact walking through these steps, okay? Um, When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall not be liable. But if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past and its owner has been warned but has not kept it in and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned and its owner also shall be put to death. Nice, easy passage. (laughs) Right? Uh, Was anyone in Exodus 21 in their Bible reading this week? And like, oh, I hope we answer this Sunday. Um, It's great. All right. Can you help me understand the, okay, so don't jump ahead, right? We've got to walk through the steps. So that's the only thing that will get you buzzed, like, not, like eh, is if, if you jump ahead into what it means for us. Can you tell me, you caught that step. <laughs> uh, anyhow, okay. 
Can you tell me in its original context what the point of this passage is? You don't have to even be right. I just want to hear voices. <laughs> Kevin, yeah. It has to do with the owner's responsibility. Yeah, good. Owner's responsibility. Owner's responsibility in regards to what? Property. Yeah, so the owner owns something, and it owns something that's really powerful, right? An ox. Have you ever tried to push one or something? <laughs> like, it's not going anywhere. Um, an ox is very capable of doing powerful good for people in plowing, right? But an ox is also very powerful and can do bad. What is the bad that the ox could do? Everyone's nodding. You guys are waking up. It's good. I know. It's been a lot. It could kill someone, right? It could harm a person, but it's specifically dealing here with killing. And so um, Moses is forbidden, forbidding here, like if we just boil this down to what is this saying, that bulls or an ox, but bull makes sense to us, right? Once proven dangerous, um, I, bulls, once proven dangerous, if it injures again, the owner must destroy a dangerous animal, right? I mean, that's at the end of the day, what's going on here is you have this animal, it did harm. If it does it again, um, the animal must be destroyed. And actually the owner is liable in this situation as well. Okay, so then the, the next step is to find the principle that's behind it. Um, I probably should have ant myself because I was kind of moving into principles here. But but what are what are some of the principles that are going on at work in this passage? Yeah, Kathy, accountability. I'll just say it first. Good job, Caleb. Yeah, accountability for our possessions in regards, especially to human life, right? In regards to other people and how those things affect them. Anything else that are principles that you see? Restitution, yeah, is, is a big part of what's going on there. Um, when harm is done to another person, that's come from our negligence would be what's said here, right? Something's dangerous. I didn't do something about it and someone else got hurt. That's a weighty enough thing that requires some consequences. Anything else? Okay, good. Um, I think if we boil those things down, the principle that we see going on here in the Mosaic Law is that it forbids reckless endangerment of other people. It would really be that principle, right? It's, it's reckless. This, this bull has already done harm. It's, it's not this ox that's just been plowing and uh, never took anyone out. And the big deal is what it does to other people. Okay, here we go. How could we apply to our situations today? First of all, does anyone own an ox? Okay, well, we're done. Problem solved. All right, this time Caleb's going to bring you the mic, but what are possible situations, and, and we'll throw out possibilities. You don't have to have for sure the right answer. We're thinking about situations that might be similar in our day and age to something that's powerful, that could harm others, that there should be accountability about how we use it. Yeah, Piper, just one sec. I was just going to say that, like, kind of ourselves. Because mm. if you don't if you aren't responsible or keeping yourself in check, like if someone gives you a warning like, hey, you weren't responsible and you didn't come to the meeting, so we had to like cancel or something. Okay. And then like you don't fix that problem, you impact everyone else. Mm. So, Yeah, so this, this overall responsibility and accountability toward how our actions may harm other people that we should be looking out for, that, that's a good thing to explore. Yeah, Patty. I think um, I thought of three things. Really, well, actually, Pat and I did. We nice. thought of dogs. Okay. <laughs> Vehicles. Yeah. I mean, you know, because they're very dangerous. And trees, like things like trees that can fall on your neighbor. Okay. 
So thinking about things that could be dangerous and our negligence could bring harm to other people. Um, yeah, dogs, trees, and cars. Okay. Good. I thought about uh, owning a gun that you don't have, uh, that you don't keep protected. Yeah, right. Not properly storing your firearms. Um, yes, can lead to much harm. Anything else? Amen. does it mean like, don't leave the keys in your bulldozer? <laughs> um, I kind of liked what Piper said about ourselves. And it yeah. just made me think of how sometimes when we just speak freely, like with our opinions or when we're passionate about something, like something happens and maybe we have friends around who aren't super familiar with that thing. And we just spew our, you know, unfiltered opinion over everything just because we're frustrated. Well then, you know, maybe later on it comes to light that we didn't really have all the information, but now they see that situation in a certain light because their introduction of everything about that was what we said, like our initial opinion. Sure. So then that can be just kind of reckless and like affecting other people. Cause then you have to do damage control and you're like, well, I didn't really mean that turns out I found out all this other stuff and that can be harmful to families. I mean, rumors, gossiping, I mean, just anything, but yeah. I've seen that and I've, I've done that before and I've I really regretted just speaking so fast and then not realizing how much it could influence someone else, how they see the situation. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so I mean, when you when you take the the principles that it has about like personal responsibility and harming others, and then you add in a layer of like our words that we see all throughout Scripture, um, that can go a lot of directions, right? Um, one of the things I I didn't put it in a slide or anything that I've always found to be a helpful way of thinking about application. It's called the ladder of abstraction. And what it is, is if you picture an A, I'm an A, <laughs> uh, like, so triangle thing, cross beam. Uh, as you're near the top of it, the, the bar going across is a short distance, right? And that's the top being the closest principle to the passage. And so you're at the top of the ladder of abstraction. For this, um, it would be something like, ha I mean, having a bull and dealing with it properly would be the very top of that, right? But then we can come down that ladder of abstraction, but as you do, the gap gets a bit wider, which means it doesn't mean that it's an invalid principle. It just means understanding you're getting further from the original intent of it. Um, and so we could move from a bull at the very top to something that's heavy and powerful that does farm good that can also harm others, which would be like tractors or something like that. And we're still really close. It's just a modern context thing. As we go further down, we can get into things like our words and those are valid and especially as scripture unpacks harm that they do. But it's also helpful to realize it's farther down the ladder of abstraction, right? And so um, it again, doesn't mean it's invalid or anything, but it is helpful to realize, especially as you're like teaching or preaching or instructing others from scripture, the farther down we get on that ladder, the more we'd want to turn to other passages probably to make that point even more directly, which is just a helpful thing to see too, even as we've been unpacking it. Um, so I, I think that's been great. You could see how there's all kinds of... Um, potential applications from a text like that. Caleb, you can probably be seated. Um, thank you. Um, do you see also that it's not just about what does it say to do and not do, but also how would we start to view the world? What is God, what kind of person is God calling us to be? And we would say a passage like this calls us to view people as very valuable and important and making sure that they're not harmed to be a very high priority. That's, that's becoming the kind of person who will see things well. And it's going to change. This is what's fascinating. As, as you mentioned trees, I'm like, how's a tree? Oh, they can fall. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, but, but you can become a kind of person who can start to see, like you go out in your yard or you consider having a person over, or you consider like how we use the church building and you consider the potential for harm that could take place, and we put and we understand that there's great responsibility on people 
being harmed in these buildings that takes effort on our parts, which is why we have a security team that does sweeps in the building, making sure doors are locked in between services so people can't go off and get lost in them or things happen to them in those doors, especially as we have children all over the place. Um, these are things that justify our nursery and children's policies. They're things that justify how we make sure we take care of the grounds and consider people. We could say church is just about spiritual things. That's all that matters. And instead, like passages like this help us see, wait a minute, we come to be people who view other people's well-being as very important to us. And it takes effort and steps to do that. Um, the, so you consider how to apply it to the situation. If we go kind of closest to the, the scenario that's being talked about here in Exodus, um, Dave, Daniel Doriani says um, the closest things would probably be work hazards, including machinery like tractors and threshers. Since equipment toils in mankind's place, which is what an ox is doing, but it can also harm us, right? It, it does the work that we could do, but it does it way faster, but it can also hurt us really badly. Um, like bulls, heavy equipment, chemicals, and transportation can serve us and yet harm us. That's why with cars and things too. Wow, we can get places. We can also do a lot of damage with them. And so it helps us think about the careless operation of equipment and how that could harm other people. And so the last step though is verify by comparing to other scriptures. And this is what tests our applications, right? This is why when we're talking about words harming other people and stuff, it's like, yeah, these are valid because the rest of Scripture is telling us, consider the weightiness of your words and how those will do harm. Other things um, we may say, well, I think that's going too far. If we were to think about other Scriptures testing the way we responsibly use our things, you know, Deuteronomy 22.8 is commanding Israel to put um, parapets around their roofs, so these little fences, so when people sleep on their roof at night because it's nice and cool up there, they don't accidentally fall off. Well, that takes cost and effort to do that, but why is it important? Because people matter, and if it's your stuff, you should think about what it might do to people. And so, okay, that's validating some of the applications that we've talked about. And then there are other texts that are imposing penalties for things that happen by negligence, not just, oh, I was actively seeking to hurt somebody and hurt them. Of course, I need punished. Oh, I was negligent in the things that I did. There's a level of responsibility I bear that helps shape us in that. So, great. Well, good job, everyone. Um, the takeaway in all of this is if we just walk out of here thinking this, God intends for all of Scripture to have an effect upon us. And if we just come to Scripture as we seek to understand what it's saying and say, what's its intended effect upon me? The Lord uses that by his Spirit with the Word to conform us more and more into the image of Christ. And it's just this beautiful, lifelong process. So um, hopefully some of these tools could be encouraging to you as you uh, look back at them in your own study and especially if you're uh, teaching others as well. So let me pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and it, it humbles us every time we just consider what all it takes to understand it and to apply it. And yet it's so encouraging because you're constantly doing this for us and to us, especially as we come and we hear it preached, as others teach it, and then as we study it ourselves. We pray that you'd make us people who are more and more humbly dependent upon your very word to be shaped more and more into the image of our Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen.